All right. Okay, everyone, welcome. This is Nina Kachadorian, who is currently in Berlin. Thank you so much, Nina, for joining with us, knowing that you are six hours ahead right now. So it's, I believe, 8 p.m. there. Mm -hmm. So we won't keep you up too late, just mm -hmm. a few hours. I would like to introduce uh, Nina by saying that she, if you do not already know her or her work, Nina is an interdisciplinary artist whose work includes video, performance, sound, sculpture, photography, and public projects. I actually have some very good friends who saw her work, who have told me all about it. I wasn't there. The 2015 Venice Biennial in the Armenian Pavilion, which won the Golden Lion for Best National Participation. She's been in a million shows and is represented everywhere, all amazing places. <laughs> That's my new rhetoric. Um, <laughs> Nina lives both in Brooklyn and Berlin, although she's currently in Berlin. She's a clinical full professor on the faculty of NYU Gallatin. She was, and she is currently represented by Catherine Clark Gallery and Pace Gallery. If you've been paying attention to our posts, the most recent image that we showed is from her series, Monument to the Unelected, um, 2009 to ongoing. I'm super excited. I've never actually met Nina in person. Um, but I've always wanted to. I have invited her to BSC. She's been too busy, but she has been there a few times, and I think the most recent might have been 2013, if I'm correct. Mm, that sounds right. Yeah, um, I would love to come back. It's not for lack of not wanting to come back. No, no. Um, yeah. I was just want to say the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Thank I'm you. super excited and thank you so much for your time. I'm just Thanks, Kristen. And I just I want to say to those of you who don't know VSC, the Vermont Studio Center, that it is a amazing, fantastic place. I have visited many times as a visiting, I guess sort of technically I was called a visiting artist, which meant I didn't do a residency, but I just met with residents and did studio visits and have had I think at least three really lovely visits up there. So um, those of you who are artists, it should be on your radar, apply. Maybe some of you have already gone and had the lovely experience of being there, but um, I'm a big fan and supporter and I hope to come back sometime. Um, I'll keep on to be, you, Yeah, yeah, please don't give up. Um, so thanks for coming. I'm going to, um, this is a, a kind of curious talk because I'm not going to talk about more than two, two only projects. Um, and I was, I, I was prepared to speak about this piece called Monument to the Unelected, which is very much kind of um, uh, preoccupying me at the moment. Um, it's been a really exciting year for this ongoing project. But as I was preparing this talk, I also kind of made a connection for the first time that um, not thematically, but methodologically, it has a lot to do with another piece I've made um, kind of on the heels of my grandmother and something she made that, um, that I thought had an interesting connection. And I, so it, it's sort of two things I've only just put together myself, but I'm going to start the talk. I will share my screen now and start the talk by talking about, um, yeah, not only Monument to the Unelected, the long and winding tale of this piece, which um, I will get into the, the details and the weeds of before the hour is out. But before that, I want to talk about this piece, which is called The Nightgown Pictures. And I made it in 2004, and it is based on a family document, which um, this is how my piece is exhibited, but I'll sort of also show you what this family document looks like and, and what it is. Um, this is the object that this piece sort of <laughs> evolves out of. And it is a small cotton nightgown. Um, my grandmother made this for my mother, uh, for actually for my mother's older sister. She, my mother's older sister is six years older than my mother. So my mother's older sister would have been the first one to wear this nightgown. And then my mother sort of wore it as a hand-me-down when it was her turn. Um, it's an object that we still have. And what my grandmother decided to do was every year on the girl's birthdays, she would put the child in this nightgown and photograph the child somewhere outside. Um, this was a time of year when my mother's family would have been spending the summer in the Finnish archipelago. This is a, um, my mother's from Finland and, and this part of the Finnish archipelago is somewhere that I know very well too. I've grown up spending all my summers there. Um, and um, these pictures, year after year, taken on the birthdays, were eventually, many years later, compiled into an accordion-folding book. 
that traced the growth of the body in the nightgown as the nightgown stayed the same size. What I did in 2000, well, it took many years to do this. My mother and I made several trips together to sort of locate all the original sites where these photos were taken. So on the left, you see the cover of my grandmother's book. Um, this is written in Swedish and would roughly translate to say the story of why Stina's first nightgown became too small. And of course, the story of why is the, the story of because people grow up <laughs> and grow out of things. And then the cover of my book, which I made in sort of a similar um, style with pressed flowers similarly, talks a little bit about the various obstacles, visual or mental in some ways, that we encountered along the way to making this piece and effectively kind of tracing my grandmother's footsteps, my mother and I now doing this together. So what I've done in my work is to take the picture on the left, which is the picture from the original photo series my grandmother made, and then to kind of pair it with the picture on the right um, of the site as it looked at the time when we took the picture. And it goes through year after year, as you can see, the girl getting bigger and the nightgown staying the same size. And this, I think this is such a remarkable record. Um, it's a remarkable, to me, artwork. Um, it traces so many sort of displacements as well as um, locations that point to kind of where my family was spending time and how they were growing up. But I guess I wanted to show it to you because um, the logic of it is that you take something that stays the same and kind of watch as things change around it. And that is very much how the piece I'm going to focus on most tonight, Monument to the Unelected, works. Um, this is the last photo where she's outgrown. By definition, the series ends at the point when she has outgrown the nightgown and can only hold it up in front of her long <laughs> teenage legs. Um, so back to Scottsdale now and Monument to the Unelected, which was um, a piece commissioned by the Scottsdale Museum of Contemporary Art for a show that they were doing as a 10 year anniversary show. Um, ten, the museum had been around for 10 years at that point and they wanted to do a show on humor, um, which they called Seriously Funny. And they invited a number of artists to come and make some new work for the show. And I was one of the artists they invited to come and, and make a commission. So I did this site visit to Scottsdale and Phoenix um, in October, 2008 in order to have a funny idea. <laughs> and this is not an easy thing. I, I'm often asked about humor um, in my work and there is a lot of humor in my work. It's something that I like to often use as a device, very knowingly kind of set things up in a way that um, welcome people in and bring them close and it functions as a kind of bait really. And then I can, as I sometimes say, once I've brought someone in, I can kind of close the door behind you and actually talk to you about something. Um, so I, I'm very aware of, of the humor in my work, but I, I really don't try to make things that are funny. And it was the first time I'd ever been asked to do that. And it was very difficult. And in fact, the harder I tried, the harder it got. Um, so I was walking around Phoenix and Scottsdale, you know, trying to kind of think of funny things. And these were the sorts of landscapes that, um, that were present there at the time. The election was coming up. You can see here in the background, the Obama-McCain you know, face-off. Um, Arizona was McCain. He, McCain, the um, Republican candidate, was a senator from Arizona, as you probably remember. So, um, so this landscape was really striking. And I found myself sort of paying attention to it and thinking, you know, it's such a particularly, um, I think, American thing to do. I, I don't think I've ever seen this happen in any other country I have visited in advance of an election. And it's, it's more than just the kind of proliferation of the signs. It's the particular kind of design that they have. And, and this kind of, you know, I kind of knew it when I saw it sort of feeling about them. Um, I was also struck by things in Phoenix and Scottsdale, like the sign here you can say, see that says Indian School Road. And, um, you know, although I grew up in California and there's a very long and terrible history there too of what happened to Native Americans, which is, I mean, it's obviously true all over the US. Um, I was really sort of in Scottsdale thinking about that in a way that I think I had sort of 
gotten a bit you know blind to in my home state and it just got more and more and more horrible and tragic the more i thought about the more I tried to have a funny idea, the more I felt like I just kept saying things that were terrible. And um, I, I went to a museum where there was an amazing exhibit on Indian schools and, and learned about these institutions, which were basically, if you don't know about them, a kind of forced assimilation and um, kids were taken away from their families and it was just terrible. So I was, I was sort of descending into this very dark side of um, US history. And at the same time, there were all these reminders of current political events. And, um, and there was something sort of also very <laughs> intriguing to me about these signs. Sometimes, you know, where they go is, is in fact quite hilarious. Like if you look at that little parent support Miranda one, like look at this tiny patch of grass, it's kind of stuffed into, like these, these sorts of sites are, are often very amusing too. So all of this, while trying to have a funny idea, kind of collided, I guess, for me. And I thought I would really like to try to make a work that could help us think about the collective American past um, and sort of our history, but in a way that also has kind of a humorous turn to it. And I decided that I would focus on these election signs. And I thought, what if I made a set of these election signs that in fact, have on them the names of everybody who ran for the office of president but lost. And that would be a way of kind of thinking about all the choices collectively not taken and, and all the, uh, you know, the possible futures that could have been. Whether you would feel happy or sad about any of those futures would be totally up to you. I mean, I wasn't going to dictate that. I was in some sense just presenting facts as they had happened. So that's what I, that's what I proposed. And that's what the Scottsdale Museum of Contemporary Art helped me produce. And during that first election cycle in 2008, we showed the work on three different public sites in Scottsdale and Phoenix. So I'll take you through three very different sites and tell you a little bit about what happened on one of them. So if you remember back in 2008, nine, the mortgage crisis, the housing lending crisis was particularly bad in Scottsdale, Phoenix. And so um, on this site, which was in front of a residential home, uh, I wanted to have some signage that sort of fit into that real estate context. So the, the sign explaining this is called Monument to the Elected was sort of inconspicuously put off to the side here and you could take a flyer or call this number which led you to a museum outgoing voicemail that explained what this all was. But the effect of this, as I hope you can see, was that somebody living in this home just really, you know, did not really know what year it was or what, you know, had some kind of co crazy sort of version of, of election concerns perhaps this year. Um, all of these signs are designed from scratch. They are not historical signs. This was not um, that kind of a research piece. So I designed all of them together with a great designer named Evan Gaffney based on actual election signs that I either saw in Scottsdale or found pictures of online. And all of them were designed in this kind of contemporary vernacular um, so that they would look like these people really were running for office now. And what I hoped would happen is that there was this kind of double take where you, you know, you think you know what you were, you were seeing and then you'd have to kind of like stop and think again. Um, there were some <laughs> really interesting things that happened this first go around. Um, this was one of the other sites. I'm just gonna briefly show you this one. This was a, a vacant lot, which was kind of also a typical kind of site in Scottsdale where we would find these kinds of signs. Um, I'd say about half these signs got stolen, unfortunately, and we ended up sort of deinstalling the whole site. In front of the house, nothing went missing, which was quite interesting. I think people's, people's feeling about private property like kind of guarded this one in some way. And then the third site, and I'm sorry for this horrible, horrible quality picture. I realized preparing this talk that all of my master um, files for this documentation are stuck on a computer in Brooklyn. So I don't have them here, but I hope you can at least kind of see through the pixelation that here the piece is installed on this corner. And what would happen is you would come off of a freeway off ramp where that black car now is there on the right hand side. You'd sort of pull up to a light and then um, if you made a right turn, you would sort of sweep your way by the remainder of all these signs. Um, so this is the site as it looked before installation. 
Um, and I want to show you this to show you there's a big commuter parking lot just off of this site and um, guarding the commuter parking lot are a whole bunch of CCTV cameras. So we had the house, we had the vacant lot, and we had this site. And you know, it was hard, I will say, to install on this site because that ground is was unbelievably hard packed dirt. And we we were working in really hot weather and we really sweated out to install these signs. And I'm telling you this not as a sob story, but because it becomes relevant. Um, I had returned to New York and got a call from the curator, Cassandra Koblenz, who it must be said at this point, is one of the most sort of heroically dedicated curators I've ever worked with. And on this piece, she really, she was put through the ringer a couple times because it, it, it was so, um, it got so complicated. But she called me up and she said, something totally bizarre has happened. Um, all of the signs have disappeared from Price Road. Like not just a few, not like on the vacant lot where a few went missing and then more went missing, but all of them at once are gone. And the site in fact now looked exactly like what you are looking at here. So I said, what, you know, what? And, and she was like, I don't know, I'm going to get to the bottom of this. I can't tell you why yet. So she, she kind of became this detective mm -hmm. and discovered that because of those CCTV cameras on the parking lot, one of them was able to see that the day before there had been this white van that had shown up and had somebody got out of the van and it started like pulling up all of these signs out of the ground and throwing them into the van. And this was not easy because it was pretty hard to get them in. So it was quite some work. It took a while. And the van eventually collected all the signs and drove off. So Cassandra then had to figure out, you know, what was this van? And it turns out this was a city van, a sort of city of Scottsdale, um, I forget what the agency was, but when she kind of saw, I guess, a logo or something on the van, she was able to call that division and found out that what had happened was the following. Obama, this is now, by the way, um, this is now happening in February 2009. So Obama has already won the election and he's on his way to Scottsdale because of the housing crisis to sort of visit and speak about the problem and tell everybody what he was going to do about it. And um, on his way from the airport to wherever it was he was going to speak, he had to pass um, through town. So a city worker had apparently gotten a call saying, please go and take down the anti-Obama signs that are on <sighs> blah, blah, blah location. And this guy drove around looking for that and arrived at my piece and thought that that's what this was. So everything got deinstalled. And um, I mean, it's quite funny thinking about it on many levels. Like, why is it that anti-Obama signs would have to be taken away from the president's sensitive eyes? Like, that's kind of funny to me to begin with. But Cassandra went to this um, depot, city depot or wherever, where they um, took away signs that were not supposed to be in public and found, documented this interesting kind of yard for me where there were a whole bunch of other signs that had been taken away. Um, and then the dumpster where these people said, if the signs are still around, they would be in this dumpster. So it's like, okay, will they be in the dumpster? And there was nothing left in the dumpster. So they had all been thrown out. We lost a whole set of signs. Um, but I feel like the story is worth it. It was just, <laughs> just one of the stranger ways I've ever lost an artwork. Um, and the guy, the city worker who did it, when, when asked about it was like, yeah, I thought there were a lot of them, I think is what he said. <laughs> So that was the story there. Um, then every election cycle since then, I have tried to show this piece. And it has been um, a really, really interesting experience to sort of see the different places it's traveled and to kind of understand how, different, how differently it's received given the site. And also, most importantly, how differently it's received given what's happening in the election that year. So I'm going to show you a bunch of others leading up to our current moment. Um, the election cycle 2012, I had it in two public sites and one indoor site. Um, I, I am always happy to show this piece in galleries and I'm doing that this year in two different places, but, um, but it's really important to me that there's at least one public site every time as well. So I just want to sort of say that's kind of the, the logic for me has been one of sort of trying to spread it across a, across a variety of places, but one of them has to always be public. Um, I got to show it in the windows of the Washington, sorry, the Wall Street Journal um, headquarters. Wait a minute, wait a minute. No, 
Is that right? Yes, Wall Street Journal headquarters. I, I wanted to say the Washington Post, but that's not right. So this was an interesting site in DC, in part because obviously it's a city full of politics, but also because on the site they had um, this news ticker that kind of ran constantly across the, the I kind of faked the corner, but this, this really was on a corner here. Um, and, and there was something about seeing this kind of current news feed up against all these moments from the past that, um, that was kind of a really nice, pleasant accident. Like we, I hadn't thought about that when they offered this site, but it was one of my favorite things about this site. So it was there. And then it was also up in front of this colonial era house in Ridgefield, Connecticut, which, which is a house that the Aldrich Museum in Ridgefield, Connecticut has as part of their property and exhibition space. Um, and this was sort of an interesting fit because basically this house dated back roughly to the time of the first kind of, not exactly elections. I learned a lot about election history through doing this piece. There weren't sort of, there was a different system then than the sort of election system we have now. And I won't, I won't get into the weeds of that. But, um, but here it was kind of again, like in a, in a timeline of a sort. Um, and then four years ago, um, the museum, Scottsdale Museum of Contemporary Art has much to my, um, I'm very happy about this. They have committed to showing the piece every election cycle now. So they showed it again in 2016 in the museum. And then it was also on um, the Lefferts Historical House site in Prospect Park, Brooklyn. And this is Lefferts House. And Lefferts House was um, a farm that was built in, um, well, it was built, it was burned to the ground, then they built this house again. But 1783 is when this house dates to. And um, it was a really wonderful site because there was, you can't see it in this picture, but a big um, wrought iron fence kind of in front of it, up front of this, of this lawn area that separated it from a sidewalk. Um, and so people could walk by it and they would sort of see it very easily through the fence, but it was also kind of, it made it sort of feel like a private home. I think that was the thing I really liked. And you know, all these different sites where signs have disappeared. I just want to say, not a single site disappeared from Brooklyn, and anybody could have actually just walked into the park and taken these all. So I felt sort of proud of my my fellow um, Brooklyn citizens that they <laughs> nothing bad happened in Brooklyn. Um, so uh, yes, the piece was up here too, and um, here you see it before the election results are known, and then the ritual has become that. Um, I add the sign of the newest loser candidate, losing candidate to the group. So I came out there on a rainy morning um, and added the Hillary sign to the ground. And there was a bunch of press there. Um, I got interviewed a couple times. Um, and um, it has been important throughout this project for me to maintain a kind of neutrality, I would say, about my own sort of feelings about the election. So it sometimes is meant that I have to really suppress what I'm feeling about the election in order to, as in this moment, kind of come out of the door of that house and in a rather sort of dead, you know, what's the word? Um, yeah, neutral way, um, you know, put the sign into the ground. Um, I guess the way I've come to sort of see this piece is that there's a kind of paradox to it because I am working with a form which is all about a kind of partisanship. That's the whole point of these signs. You put them on your lawn to tell people, I'm voting for this person. And people put them in public to say, vote for this person. But with this piece, um, it doesn't in that sense take a position. Like you could, like I said earlier, you could sort of be pro or con any of the people whose names you see on, on any given year. Um, so it sort of does the exact opposite of what these signs are usually there to do. Um, it doesn't work that way. Um, I think it also has a function as a kind of curious history test. There are, there are ways in which, for me anyway, I realize some of these names are names I never think about, I don't know anything about, I've never even heard of, and they're kind of lost in history for me and it seems for many others um, as well. One proof of that I will share with you is uh, just two days ago, I got an email from a friendly stranger. Let me show you this particular sign. Um, yeah, okay, so if you look on the far right-hand side, it says Adams, there's a triangular uh, diamond-shaped sign that says Adams, and then it says behind it, Bush, 
1828 with this big red face on it. I got an email from a str friendly stranger who said, um, I, I wondered if you knew that your 1828 sign has a typo in it. And I thought, oh my God, what? And he said, yeah, it's Adam's Rush. It was Richard Rush who was his running mate in 1828. And I thought, oh God, <laughs> how did this slip past me? I had two Ivy League historians read my list of names and I researched the hell out of this. And yet somehow this error for 12 years has been like creeping through. But on the other hand, it sort of proves my point that um, it took that long for anybody to really know Richard Rush, not somebody Bush. Uh, anyway, so too late to correct it for this time, but I'm, I'm going to correct it for the next go around. Um, yes, so there here is the Hillary sign with all the other losing candidates. And um, that brings us to this election cycle, which I have to say has been an incredibly exciting one. I have never ever had as many simultaneous showings of this piece as this time. And I think what I've come to realize is that, you know, as with last time when it was such a kind of tense election, this time it feels even more so. And somehow this project seems to really mean something different to people or they want to sort of be thinking through this project maybe or, or indicating something by showing it. Um, so the, the project, I'm happy to say, is in a lot of public locations this time. And I'm going to show you some of the ones where it's already up, and then I'll sort of tell you about the ones where it will still be up. Um, and it's also a good time to say that both the galleries that I work with, Catherine Clark Gallery and Pace Gallery, have been incredibly great collaborators in this. They have helped, um, helped find these public sites. Um, we had a sort of discussion all together and, and discussed how important we thought it would be to really make a point to put the piece in swing states. So I'm really happy that we have several on this yeah. list. Okay, so um, here it is at Pace, you know, in a clean white box kind of space, like, you know, gallery style. And it will be going up at Catherine Clark Gallery um, uh, in a show that opens um, October 26th. I think that's right. I hope that's right. Um, here it is in Scottsdale, where they have installed it again in front of a, a private home. Um, and I really love this site. I find this house like somehow it's, it's really, it really fits this house. And so um, it's been there now for a couple weeks. Um, we took the, they took the um, real estate sign out of storage. They had saved it and it's there on the corner, as you can see, it's being reused. This time around, we have QR code technology. So there's a little QR code instead of a phone number where you can scan it and immediately go to a website that tells you what this is. Um, and I have, I've been sort of insistent that this piece should not be um, uh, overly signaged. I don't want my name anywhere near it on site. I don't, I just, the title and how to find out more, that's it. I do not want this thing to sort of announce itself as an artwork um, if possible. This is the installation in Santa Ana, California, um, Grand Central Arts, um, Grand Central Arts Center has, has um, sponsored, been the host for um, this project and found a um, fantastic host for it, um, who has uh, we put in on, on this front lawn. And um, there's something really nice to me here about the kind of palm tree, really California landscape, um, bright, bright, bright light and these bright, bright, bright signs. Um, on this site so far, it's just been getting tons and tons of traffic. It's been a really, really visible, um, good site for this piece. So I've been, um, this was today, this was the front page of the Times, Orange County Times. Um, and I got a nice text from John Spiak, the director of Grand Central Arc saying, top of the fold, front page, top of fold. So we were really happy about this coverage. And also today, the install just a few hours ago finished in Madison, Wisconsin. So it's here, um, also in front of a private home, in front of the home of actually a former um, um, judge for, um, for uh, Judge Abrahamson, who, who was a judge in Wisconsin for a very long time. And, um, and uh, again, on a, on a site which is um, a place apparently in this neighborhood where people tend to put a lot of election signs during an election cycle. So there was something um, nice I was told about the fact that these are going somewhere where people are used to seeing signs like that. And what I'm wondering is if people are going to add to it, in which case I have to make a decision about what to do. <laughs> do I take them away? Do I leave them? Does it kind of, I don't know, I can't decide. Should I just let them sprout more and more? Um, 
I need to give some thought to it. Um, and then still to come will be uh, Catherine Clark Gallery in San Francisco, in the gallery, and then two sites in Cleveland, the Museum of Contemporary Art, where it's going to be in, on, a, on a street corner in front of the museum in three sort of green um, planting, planter areas that are sort of like pieces of the sidewalk have been, um, of, of this paved area in front have been taken out, and then there's this kind of landscaping there. So, um, and then Transformer Station in Cleveland, which has a big front lawn, and then also in a very urban location in Oakland, California, um, where there's a sort of uh, Roots Community Health Center, which is an amazing place. I've just kind of become acquainted with them through, through this project. But, um, but they are hosting it and, and building a sort of scaffolding structure that will hold the signs um, on it in front of their building. So it's, it's pretty widespread this time. And, um, and then, as is the tradition, once the election results are known, there will be a new sign added. And what I'm really hoping to do this time is to have a first time voter standing by to add the sign in each of these locations. And I'd like to sort of do it as a live event. And we're trying to sort of figure out how the logistics of that will work. There's also, of course, this interesting question of, um, Will we have a clear result? What will happen once there is a result? Like a little bit of what's going to happenness around the whole situation this time. Um, but I have made my my two signs. So I, I just want to show you also my favorite sign, real sign of all time, which just has it's just the design of this. I think is somehow so. I, I don't know, I, I will not put in an adjective here, but it's, it's very much in its own category, um, very particular. And I decided for the two signs for this year to base the Trump sign on the Ron Ray Mayer sign. Um, so this, these are the two signs. They have already been produced. Um, I always make them for both candidates. I mean, it would be totally jinxy to not do that. Um, and I'm using the Trump sign I had ready to go last time in case, and now I have it ready to go this time in case. Um, and we will see which one is going to get added. So, um, yeah, that's, that's my show and tell. And now I'm happy to kind of make it a conversation. We'll stop the screen share. Are there questions in the chat? Um, there was one. Yeah, so oh, yeah. Sherman to... Clark. Hi, Sherman. <laughs> <laughs> I can Good answer one. that. Um, does it matter if they win or lose? Um, do you mean, wait, I don't know if I understand the question actually. Sherman, can you clarify in the chat perhaps or, or just speak? speak? Everyone is muted just so everyone oh, okay. knows. I have everyone muted. So if you have a question, just write it into the chat and either Anita will answer it directly or I can read it off to her, especially when they all pile in. Or maybe you did answer the question, Kristen. Maybe it's, mm -hmm. oh, oh, I see, Sherman. If someone adds a sign to one of the public sites, does it matter? Well, yeah, I, I, it's never happened. So it's sort, of an interesting, it's sort of an interesting question. And I think that it's most likely to happen on that, on that Madison, um, Wisconsin site because the neighborhood uses that site for these signs. So I don't know, what do you guys think I should do? <laughs> I have a chance to actually like pull the, pull the people. So. Um, what make an argument about I, i'd like to know what you think actually if you have an opinion on it sherman what do you think i should do you would be a really good person to ask sherman says i'm not sure okay yeah it's it is sort of tricky i mean it um the funny thing though is that if you add the sign of the candidate you want you're adding a losing candidate so there's this kind of funny thing of like, maybe you're jinxing the person you want to have win. I mean, I'm kind of amused by that idea that you'd have to kind of reverse the logic of the piece and put the name of the person you want to see lose if you want to sort of be in keeping with it. Um, anyway, okay, well, if anyone wants to advise on this question of it, whether to call or not call additional signs, you know, just chime in on it. Um, so Eric is asking a question, Have has these, have these pieces ever attracted large uh, crowds or complaints from locals? Um, so far, no. So far, no complaints. Um, large crowds, you know, not in a way where like traffic has been stopped. I mean, you know, I think people, I think people on foot have sometimes 
sometimes maybe people have driven by and said, oh, like I walked back to see what this was. Like we've heard that before. Um, but again, like every site ends up kind of, um, kind of different and different amounts of visibility. So I, I have been so like bowled over by how many people seem to be seeing this in Orange County. Like that has been, it has been a site with a lot of visibility. <clears throat> and then, you know, um, I've learned through this as I've learned through other works that press, you know, the way press works is you get one bit of press and another bit of press and then everybody starts to just copy the press. There's a snowballing effect. People just sort of regurgitate each other's content all the time. So um, in, in Orange County right now, that's the snowballing effect is happening. Um, oh, Julie. Hi, Julie. Thanks for being here, Julie. Um, who asks, how did you get permission to place the signs in front of the private homes? Right. We have had some very, very kind people step up and volunteer. So um, this year, um, the I can sort of trace them all for you. The I was approached by Grand Central Arts to do this piece with them this time, about a year ago. And then it was John Spiak, the director there, who found one of those art centers, really sort of like long-standing supporters, um, John Wood, who um, agreed to host it in front of his house. So, you know, and same, same, same is sort of true for Scottsdale. We had a staff member one year, and this year another person who's kind of, I believe, sort of part of the Scottsdale, you know, museum community. Um, and in the case of Judge Abramson, um, the connection there is actually her son, who is also the connection, who, who knows, who's a friend of the gallery of San Francisco, um, Catherine Clark Gallery in San Francisco, but also um, is a volunteer, he does a lot of volunteer law work with Roots Community Health Center. So there was a sort of, he brought, he brought two sites into the mix, which has been really great. Um, okay, going down the chat. <laughs> yes. Um, um, I like this game theory expert. Do you mind if I read them out loud? For oh, please do. Yes, this? please is that do. Okay? Eric, yes, absolutely. Uh, okay. So the next one is um, from Eric, right? Um, yeah. Should find a game theory expert to opine on the aspect of adding a desired candidate to a collection of losers. Yeah. Good idea. Yeah. Um, the next one, your work is so incredibly varied. What is your process for deciding where to focus your work and how will you decide what longevity to give to the election piece? Yeah, I mean, I do make a lot of really different things and that's because I like working responsibly, you know, to, um, to the world, <laughs> to things out there. And, and a lot of projects really start from, I often put it in these terms, but start from like the dumb stuff that surrounds us like the things that I feel are worthy of a second look or worthy of scrutiny that are never scrutinized or sort of written off as not being artwork worthy. And election signs are a perfect example of this to me. Like there turns out to be a lot of sort of, I don't know, you, there's a lot that can happen using this form, it turns out. And um, I think there's a whole other conversation to have about the sort of particular design um, which I have a sort of fantasy event one day in my mind where I would sort of speak to like a design historian about this piece or have somehow bring the conversation kind of into that realm of things. Because it's always to me a type of design which is like a little bit, um, I mean, in a pragmatic way, you have to be able to see it at a distance and quickly get the message. But there, there are all these tropes, you know, there's wavy sort of stars and stripesy things, but, but certain typefaces which just seem to kind of be appropriate for these signs or they're always used and others that are not and um and a kind of like basic not over designed not too fancy kind of design not too highbrow you could say design um to some of these like i'm really interested in why that is like is that about a kind of popular appeal you know what is this communicating this candidate is approachable like that's why i think that ron um, Ron Mayer one is, is so interesting because it's so reduced and so basic and looks like it's barely been designed. Um, so what, what, what did that candidate think looked, looked appropriate for his campaign about that sign? Like those are things that are very interesting to me. Um, so I've, I've gotten off track of this question, but how, how do I decide? I mean, I really love assignments. It was such a great thing to have Scottsdale Museum of Contemporary Art come and say, like, make something for the show. And it was a bit of a puzzle to solve, as I've described to you. But 
but um, it helped me think about something, the parameters around it helped me think about something that I, I don't know that I would have engaged if I didn't have this assignment. Um, and then I guess in terms of how, what the longevity of this piece will be, I, I don't know, I can't imagine not showing it four years from now based on what happened this time. So I think it'll just keep going, keep going as long as people are using these election signs, I guess. Um, I, I don't know, I haven't made any kind of decision about it. So if there's interest, the piece will continue, I guess. Uh, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump over the next one for a second, second and go back to it because somebody okay. was asking about the design elements. Yeah. Um, yeah. How do I design, decide the design elements? Um, and the symbolism, for example, Trump sign is blue, not red. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I wanted to kind of make it clear. That was a really deliberate decision um, because there is often this confusion around, are these actual candidate signs? Like, are these the real historical signs? And you wouldn't think that about Herbert Hoover, but you might think it about Romney Ryan, or you might think it about Clinton. Um, so the more recent candidates, let's say going back to like, maybe like, you know, the 70s might be, you could think that maybe that's how I made this piece. So somehow making the Trump sign blue was a way of, I thought pretty clearly signaling, like this is not an official campaign sign, or it probably would be red. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I have, I mean, it would be, I should prepare this for a future PowerPoint, but I have a whole huge folder of fol folder full of the images of actual signs. And then sort of, I should pair them with the ones that Evan and I designed in imitation of those, because we, we really kind of copied quite often really a sort of pretty closely the graphic design feel of them. Um, yeah, so I hope, I hope, Joseph, that answers your question. That's how we design the design elements. I'm, I'm just a really big believer in, you know, if you want something to blend into the world or blend back into the world, like model it on the real thing. Mm -hmm. So it helps that happen. Uh, here's another one. This is interesting. Um, does, pri does a private home get paid by displaying those signs and how much of their life is affected by this installation? Oh, yeah. Um, no one has gotten paid. We have just been deeply, deeply grateful. Um, I mean, like I said, people have volunteered, so it hasn't been a question of needing to pay anyone. Um, I, I, I just, you know, I'm etern eternal, eternally indebted to those who have hosted the piece. Um, and, and, you know, I will say like this time around in particular, the, the, particularly maybe the person hosting it in Santa Ana has been such a great ambassador for the piece. He's been out there talking with people and sort of, he's a very engaged person, um, I think, you know, generally, but I think in this election. And so he's there like, sort of like, what do you think? And it's really wonderful. Um, and then the second part of that question was, uh, uh, how much of their life? Um, oh, has, yeah. Um, well, hope, so far, happily, nobody has been negatively affected by it. I mean, I think that um, it's always been something where we've wanted to make sure like the neighbors would be okay with it. And, you know, there's always been a sort of preparatory, let's make sure this won't bother people to have the potential foot traffic or we had decided against one of, one, we decided against a potential site in Southern California this time around because there was some concern about traffic kind of getting congested or that being a problem. So, you know, I mean, it is really important to be considerate of the community that surrounds a private home. So that, that has been on our minds every time. Yeah. Um, let's see. Do you have any advice on how to narrow down a wide scope to a specific idea mm -hmm. like you did for this awesome project? I've been commissioned with a wide open brief and big, geographical scope. I don't want to miss the opportunity to make it mine. Yeah. Oh, God. I, it's, it's really hard. I mean, I, I flailed on this assignment for a long time. Like, I, I, I really did. I, I have not told you, like, all the really bad idea roads I went down before arriving on this one. I had some really, like, really, really mediocre ideas. So I, you just keep, you know, you keep plugging away. And, um, and I don't know. It was, I guess what was important, maybe the, the way this kind of clicked was to, um, to not sort of push away um, the thinking that I had been doing and couldn't seem to get away from of all the upsetting history. Like, I think there could have been um, 
I was, it, maybe for a while I was trying to do that. I was thinking like, ah, oh, like why do I keep thinking of sad, unhappy things? I should be thinking of funny, happy things. And in fact, it was actually kind of thinking seriously about my thoughts going in that direction that led me to, to then think maybe I should make a piece that is about history in some way. And then like I was describing, these things kind of met up. So I guess I just think don't shove anything out as um, not a potential direction or not a potential starting point because things can kind of twist and turn and take on a different, they can take on a different path um, as you work with them. So um, that's kind of roundabout advice, but um, you know, sometimes I just, sometimes it's just a matter of like, please let the light bulb go off. <laughs> and, yeah. and, um, and I mean, I kind of wish I wasn't wired this way, but sometimes as time begins to run out, my thinking begins to sharpen because it has to. And um, so uh, the pressure is sometimes helpful, actually. Um, anyway, um, Marta, I wish you luck with the project. Uh, I'm going to jump ahead to another set of questions and I'll go back because two people are asking basically um, uh, the first project you talked about earlier in the talk and um, did you want to reflect on the parallels between those two projects? Yeah, I did mean Monument to the Unelected and the Nightgown Project as having kind of a curious connection and, and just in case I didn't make that clear, I'm thinking about a situation, a form where you have one element that stays steady as time goes on. So as you know, the nightgown stays the same thing as the locations and the body in it change, so too do the signs kind of stay more or less the same. I mean, they only change by one sign every four years, but the reaction to it, the, the, the yeah, the political climate around it changes. And it's been so dramatically changed when I think about how it felt that first election. Um, to now, it's just like, it's a really, really different kind of election um, mood 12 years later. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, here's one. Uh, I was curious on your take on monuments. Uh, monument in general are decided by power structures. Um, and you were, yeah. there is a funny twist and subversive um, moments, but I just wanted to hear more about what you think on the notion of monuments. Yeah, hey Benji. Yeah. Benji and I met in Venice, and Benji is one of the, uh, the few other half Finnish, half Armenian people that I know. So I just oh, have wow. to shout out to my, <laughs> my blood brother. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> good to see you. It's so good to see you. Um, yeah, monuments. I mean, I, 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 I taught a class on public art a couple times, and monuments were like a particularly interesting subcategory of public art, or, you know, category in it. Um, I, ah, there's so much to say about this. <laughs> it is in some ways a kind of, um, yeah, I would agree, Benji, that it is sort of a subversive monument for the loser. I mean, in some ways, like a lot of these people, um, it's sort of like they never had their time in the sun. I mean, they, maybe they could have been a great leader. Maybe they, you know, would have done great things for the country. Um, the other thing, I didn't say this earlier, but in the array of signs, there are also people who ran for office um, having had one successful you know, bid for president and then lost the second time or the other way around. So there are names there where they have very much had a sort of starring role as president too. So um, not everybody there only lost, I guess is what I wanna say. Some of them won once and then not the other time. Um, but it, it, yeah, I do think about like all these, all these, all these sort of like, don't know about them anymore. Like they're sort of, they're, they're, you know, Richard Rush. <laughs> I have to go and read about him now. <laughs> so, yeah. But monuments are also, I would say, they're very interesting terrain in public spaces because um, like, I'm going to take a little diversion here now, but I had a commission years ago from um, the US government <laughs> to make um, a permanent public work for a border crossing station between um, a very small town in Northern Maine called Van Buren and the Canadian town on the other side called, um, oh my God, I've just completely spaced it out. I'm so sorry. Arr, it's left my brain for a moment. But these two small towns were separated by um, a river. The river was the physical border. Um, and there was this border crossing station there that had been um, heavily damaged when the river one year like rose really high and they were sort of 
preparing to rebuild the border crossing station and build a much bigger one. And this is part of actually Obama's um, Recovery Act money that got like pumped into the site and they built this absolutely enormous border crossing station. And what they do when they build these government buildings is they have a program called Percent for Art. So 1% of the building's budget is allocated towards artwork for that building. And to be brutally honest, often the artwork isn't particularly wanted by the um, people who will be occupying the site. It's kind of a, like, there's, there's sometimes a little bit with these types of commissions, a little like, oh, do we have to have art? And so I was aware of that going into this. And, um, and I said yes to the commission because I also thought that the border site was a really, really interesting site. I'm interested in these kinds of situations and it seemed challenging and it took, it was challenging. It took four years to work out a piece that finally everybody felt okay um, and happy with producing. We had several failed proposals. I, mean, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I think back on some of the things I thought they might do and I realized there's just a certain kind of humor you can't, it, it will not fly on an, on, a, on an international border crossing. But what I did get away with, and I'm pretty happy about this, um, was to work within a kind of monument meets tourist attraction vernacular. And I ended up thinking a lot about like these two sorts of things, like what, it, what you encounter on a border crossing site is often a moment where there's like a sign or a statue or a thing that says like, welcome, you are now in Maine. And then sometimes they kind of quickly tell you a lot of like symbolic things about the place, like sort of, you know, these kind of heraldic almost kind of things. Um, and I thought, um, that's interesting. That seems to happen a lot at that moment. Yeah, you are now here. And here's what here is. And then the other thing is like, when you think of monument, what you think of, you think of something permanent, you think of something serious, you think of something, and then I thought, you think of something bronze. <laughs> and I have to make something that has to last outside in Maine for 80 years. I think I need to make something out of bronze. And bronze always looks like really serious art. That's the other thing about it. It looks really monumental, like right away. So what I did is I researched all of the state symbols of Maine. Um, and it turned out there was this wildly long and overdetermined list of them. Like it wasn't just like a few things, it was like 20 things. And they were things like the, the state mammal, which was the moose. Then there was the state cat, the Maine Coon cat. Then there was the state flower, the state tree, the state this, but then as the list went on, it got to be sort of like the state, the state beverage, the state dessert, the state treat, different from the state dessert. Um, the state um, like, Arctic exploration vessel, like it, it just got, it got so curiously kind of um, like ornate. And I decided to make a sculpture where all of these things were in one place. So there was a moose, a full-size bronze moose with a coon cat on its back, chickadees on all the antlers, which is the state bird, and then a pie and a can of moxie soda and whoopie pies and all of the things on the damn list that sort of were on the sculpture. And that sculpture went on the border crossing site. And it's sort of an absurd thing, but it is bronze and it is state symbols. And so it kind of has this function of like, welcome to Maine, but I also got to put, I got to put a moose with whoopie pies on it on an international border crossing site. And I'm kind of psyched about that. So, um, and mostly what I'm happy about, honestly, is the fact that the town really likes this object and they have nicknamed it Marty the Moose and people sort of have, you know, embraced it as sort of like something that the town is sort of part of the town's identity now. So it was a happy ending after four years of a lot of banging heads against walls and trying to figure out how to solve it. But that's a long-winded answer to Benji's questions about, mon about monuments. But I think that it's also an opportunity to work with what people expect from a monument. Mm -hmm. And so in the case of the moose, I was trying to come at that one way. And in the case of Monument to the Unelected, it's sort of materially the opposite because cheap corrugated plastic is not an appropriate monumental material at all. Like it's sort of much too unmonumental. Um, somebody asked this question, which um, you may have sort of answered this in a way. Um, how have you seen the lawn sign change in our culture with ever increasing online forms of campaigning? And what do you think is its future? Oh, that's a great question. I wish I knew. Um, um, I think, how have I seen it change? You know, it's a, it's a hard question for me to gauge in part because um, 
I grew up in a suburb, but I've lived the last two decades in, in really urban environments and cities. And so I, I don't see these signs pop up sort of on the lawn, the way that that's sort of my association with them. People put them in windows um, in New York. Um, and in, it's funny in Berlin, <laughs> the, the German system for this is you've got these sort of kind of pretty bendy cardboard um, placards and the candidate's face is always on them. And it, it made me like a photograph of the face. It made me realize how, how that really doesn't happen very often in the US. But then they sort of take one of the placards and put it around like a street pole and then the other one and staple them around. So these things are kind of, um, they're kind of up, up like in space all the time um, when elections are coming up. But there, there are always these people's faces. Um, so it's a very different graphic design sort of approach. It seems very important to show you the person and I guess within an American lawn sign tradition, it's much more about communicating something like confidence, patriotism, um, you know, um, uh, inclusiveness. Like I don't know. The, the, like I said, I, I'd want, I'd like to have this conversation with um, a design historian because I think maybe they could put these signs into context too. Maybe they could link them to other sorts of advertising or um, visual campaign strategies that that would help me kind of contextualize these but that's my stab at that and i i don't know the future i i i think we see them quite a bit this year again so they don't seem to be going away too bad they're all plastic uh benji has another question that um oh, yeah. uh, just because i think it's a really great question i'll read it uh rather than giving somebody else time <laughs> but um uh, is this a comment of how Americans value competitiveness? Um, huh. Interesting point. Perhaps. I mean, it's, elections sometimes feel, I mean, it's maddening to me if I'm going to now inject a bit of my own opinion, but there's something sort of like, sometimes you feel like, I, I mean, I'm a huge sports fan, so this is sort of even unfair to say, but sometimes it's approached like the worst version of a sporting event. Um, it's just it's just asinine how sort of how sort of um, uh, unsubtle the conversation becomes and how quickly it becomes that way. So I um, I feel sort of this time around also quite dismayed at the I don't know. Let's not even go there. There's so much we just bitch and moan about bad manners <laughs> like a lot right now. If you if you lose me on that topic, but. Um, but I mean, yeah, America is a place where I think there is a kind of pride taken in being, you know, being a winner and being competitive. And yeah, I would agree with that. I think that's a, it's an insightful point. Um, so winning is a big deal. And therefore, maybe, you know, losing means something in that context that's different than it would in another country. Yeah. Yeah. The piece in Maine is installed. I see Kathy's question. It is installed. It's in Van Buren. I have not gotten up there to see it yet because it is so far away. I, I didn't get to go. I haven't seen it in real yet. I've seen it at the foundry. Yeah. Uh, there was one question up above I didn't want to skip over. And I, I think you did hit on this while you were talking about it, but just so in case it got missed, uh, is there a reason why you don't use the actual signs? In the oh, well, yes, because, you know, it would give away, I think the, to be historical about this um, would immediately reveal that the temporality is not of the here and now. And I want the temporality to read as if it's all of the here and now. So I have to, I have to design. And, I, you know, candidates weren't kind of running campaigns with this kind of visual strategy. <laughs> like, you know, it was, I, I haven't gone deep into this research, but it's, I think, a very different kind of advertising that was happening. So, yeah. Cool. All right. Um, uh, I think we have time for one more burning question. <laughs> I hope that if any of you are in any of these cities, you will go and um, have a look. Yeah. I'll slip that in before we all say goodbye. Um, and... Yeah, anybody, any, yeah, I can, I'm happy to answer if anyone else is. Everyone got quiet. <laughs> okay, <laughs> maybe it's all been answered. <laughs> uh, well, I just wanna say thank you again, Nina, for your time, for your insight, for your honesty, for uh, 
um, I love that you brought up, obviously, about your humor, um, but to talk about it in this sense, uh, in this day and age, I think is super important. Um, yeah, just thank you. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you. It's so nice to nice that you all made time for this. And um, vote if you can thank you in the U.S. That. election, please. Um, I've been like, screw, you know, my students are so sick of hearing it, but I'm vote, vote, vote. I just, I just, I just took my absentee ballot to a German mailbox <laughs> and just <laughs> stuck it in there. Yeah. So off it went to Brooklyn. Good. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Thank you, everyone. It was so good to see you. Thanks your for favorite. coming. <laughs> I'll well, be wherever you are. So okay. Bye. Bye, everybody.